All right, so welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, and we have a very special guest for you today, it's a very special gift for you today. We actually have two guests, so this is a first for Time Out with the Sports Doctor. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Amanda Hahn and uh, Mr. Matt McFarlane, uh, both who are CPAs, um, and they are co-owners of Keystone CPA, so very glad to have you guys on the show today. Are you interested in real estate? Are you tired of hearing about all the money that your friends and colleagues are making from their investments, but you don't know where to start? Don't worry, I got you. We are teaming up with Dr. Ronnie Shalev and Shawin Properties to equip you with the tools you need to feel empowered about your investments. So how do you get involved? Do these three things. First, go to my website at drderekthesportsdoctor.com and click on the sponsor link for Shawin Properties. This will give you access to a free webinar, as well as the ability to have a discovery call with Dr. Ronnie Shalev. Also follow her on social media and stay tuned for more helpful tips coming at you on Money Mondays. Now back to the episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We're really excited. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. So, you know, I recently got, had a chance to interview one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Rachel Gainsbrew, um, and I know you guys are doing some work together. And one of the first names I like to ask people, you know, do you know anyone who might would, would be a good fit for this platform? And the first name that came out of her mouth was you. So, um, you know, she made an introduction and very glad to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited to um, share some tips about how to save on taxes so that we're not just working or working hard uh, losing all the our money to the government exactly like robert kiyosaki says it's not how much you earn it's how much you can keep right and how much you can have working right. for you so um you know let's get started so first let's talk about you know you guys are both cpas uh, so there's let's start off like this because they just heard taxes and cpas so somebody's about to click off give me a 30 second blurb on why this can be the most important podcast that they're, you're going to listen to this year <laughs> i love that you said someone was going to about to click off so uh what's really interesting and people a lot of people don't know this but taxes is actually our biggest expense and uh, research has shown that the average American, okay, so we're not talking about high income people, just average as a whole for Americans, we lose more money to taxes than we do on food, clothing, and housing combined. So if you think about that, you know, this is the reason why you should tune in, because when we talk about taxes, what we're really talking about is more money in your pocket. Yeah, and you're a sports doctor. I like sports, so we can talk about sports too if people want to listen to that. Perfect. <laughs> so don't tune away. It won't be all Texas. But, <laughs> right, right. You know, <laughs> but no, I think what's so special about you guys is that you know and understand the tax code and you're able to talk about it in lay terms so that it's not just a lot of jargon that overflows right over your head. So that was one of the main things that I said, man, if I can get them on to talk to the audience, we can all benefit and all grow from it. So I think that's definitely a gift that you guys have. Yeah, well, thank you. We appreciate it. We do like, we love to kind of, you know, help educate our clients and, and fellow investors out there. And because uh, as you, you know, you were, we were talking earlier, it's, not everyone's meant to be a CPA. You don't need to understand the tax code. It's just, you know, that's what your tax advisor is there to help you explain things and kind of, you know, help set you up to get you in the right position to take advantage of all the opportunities out there. Sure, sure. So talk to me about your personal journey. I know that you guys are a married couple, but tell me, you know, kind of your love for becoming a CPA. Were there similar journeys or what both led you guys to become CPAs? Yeah, well, we actually both started at, uh, we met at one of the big four accounting firms. And when I was there, I was working in, they, they call it the private client advisor group, you know, high net worth individuals, had some professional athletes, a lot of real estate investor clients. And so that's kind of where I had my, um, I, I kind of like to call it my aha moment. You know, I was, I was probably early twenties reviewing some, somebody's tax return. who was gentleman was retired in his sixties and, you know, looking at his, looking at his uh, rental schedule and his return. And you kind of, Hey, okay, he's got some depreciation expense. Yeah, I know he didn't pay anything for that. So I had that back. And this retired person back in, you know, again, early 2000s was making over $200,000 of cash flow. 
And that's when kind of the light bulb went off like, Hey, there's a, uh, there's a better way to do this. Right. Like then, you know, necessarily working your whole life to, uh, you know, so that's kind of where the, the interest started, you know, the groundwork was laid for that. And just, we've kind of tailored our practice to work, um, you know, with real estate investors and it, and it runs the gamut. It's people who are, you know, full-time real estate investors to people who have, you know, their own business, W2 job, whatever, and we're investing in real estate on the side or getting started in real estate and kind of wanting to transition that way kind of runs that whole gamut. Yeah. And I think what was really interesting about this story that Matt just talked about was well, not only was this, was this guy making 200,000 a year in cash flow, but he was also paying zero taxes. And that's the kind of the beauty of the tax planning side. We have clients who are in the medical profession. We have clients who are, you know, attorneys and even other CPAs. Um, if you're doing things correctly, there's definitely ways where you can make a lot of money, um, but really pay little to no taxes using real estate as one of the strategies. Sure. So I'll admit, I was one of the people who, when you started to hear about people who were not paying taxes, you, I would say, why in the world are they paying taxes? And I'm not, I'm angry, I'm angry. But truthfully, once I started to look into it, I said, okay, let's not be angry about it. Let's be educated about it. And let's learn how I can also decrease my tax burden. So, you know, I think that's one main topic is that you know, you can either sit back and complain about it, or you can learn how you can take advantage because the same loopholes or tax benefits that some of the wealthy um, are able to take advantage of, we too can take advantage of many of those if we're educated by them. Yeah, for sure. So we have clients who are physicians who pay very little taxes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we always say is if, you know, if, the rules are the rules. So if you just have to play by the rules, like in sports, right, you play by the rules right. and you'll be able to win the game. And so from a, you know, from a tax perspective, if you have the right facts, then you can really pay little taxes, but, but it does take some work. You know, you, you have to understand what the right facts are and then creating those facts in your situation. Sure. Sure. So tell us about the birth of Keystone. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we had, uh, after the big four, I went to a smaller CPA firm and she went to a private industry and then was kind of, we decided, hey, we wanted to kind of start our own thing. We, you know, we wanted to specialize in real estate. That's just what we understood. It's what we were passionate about. Uh, we're real estate investors ourselves. So it kind of was just a, it was a good, you know, natural, natural transition. And so we started our firm back in 2008. And, you know, so I guess going on 14 years now. Um, and uh you know, we love it. I mean, it's, it's grown. It, you know, we've got a great team behind us that can help us with the tax planning and um, it's, it's fun. It's, it's just, you know, kind of getting out there and helping them, you know, stay on, stay up to date on the tax code that, that can be challenging at times, obviously, but it's, it keeps us on our toes for sure. Yeah. I think what's yeah. really interesting is most people, when you think about CPAs, they're thinking about filing tax returns. Um, like you were saying, people might just tune out because we're talking about taxes, but we, our firm is really different in that our specialty is not on filing tax returns, it's actually on tax planning. And so, um, because really the way you save on taxes is not when you file your tax. Right? So when you file your tax, like next April, you bring your receipts and your forms to your tax person, and then they put it on the right forms. But, um, but that all they're doing is reporting what already happened last year. So they're going to say, hey, this is what you're going to owe in taxes. But tax planning is when you're meeting with your advisors throughout the year so that you are doing the right things. Um, and so that by next April, you already have the right facts, like what we're talking about. We have the right facts that you can save on taxes legitimately. So I like what you mentioned. So it's truthfully more of a relationship than just, hey, I need to get, you know, it's almost April. I need to make an appointment to come in and say, boom, here's everything I've done please don't let make me old on the taxes, but it's truthfully right. something that is a every month or quarterly meeting, or it's a relationship that you need to have, especially if you're going to be an entrepreneur investing. Yeah. And then, you know, how often you meet with your tax advisor is going to be different. You know, if you're in the middle of a deal or starting a business, you might meet pretty frequently. Um, but if you have your plan set up and, you know, there's nothing really happening in the next month or two, then maybe you don't have to meet, right? Because everyone's busy. Um, and so it's just, you know, I think for investors and business owners too, your goal or your, your goal is not to become a CPA and understand all the tax law, um, but your goal is just to know enough so that you know what questions to ask 
and when to ask questions, you know, like before I buy a property, before I refinance, before I form an entity for my business, these are times that you should talk to your tax advisor because that's where the planning opportunities are. And just, you know, keeping the, keeping the lines of communication open, right? It could be as simple as sending a quick email that, hey, I'm thinking about doing this or I'm going to, you know, buy or lease a car or I might buy this property, sell or whatever it is. It's just, it doesn't have to be a full-blown hour-long conversation all the time. It can be just a simple email and what, what, anything I need to think about, stuff like that, right? Yeah, so, and that's because you already have a relationship because if I try to pick up the phone and call you, if you don't know my background, you're not gonna be able to, to truly give me good advice just over the phone. You don't, you don't like the it depends answer? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that when I call like my advisor, she'll always say, that's a CPA or that's an accountant question, you know, <laughs> you know so I love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true, you know, I think because um, we do quite a bit of education, um, we, we work with investors nationwide, so we speak a lot nationally about tax strategies and, you know, sometimes people in the audience uh, will catch us afterwards and say, hey, you know, for, like, I'm a physician, I make 300000 or 400000 what should I do to reduce tax? Well, there's so many other things I need to know about you <laughs> before yeah, just, yeah. you know, spilling off random things. <laughs> sure, absolutely. And I apologize for my improper introduction because there's people listening and they're scratching their heads saying, Amanda Hahn, Mac McFarland, I know these names. You know these names because uh, they are authors, number one, authors of several books. So, uh, the book on tax strategies for the savvy real estate investor, which I've recently finished and left you a five-star review because it was excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank right. you. Yeah. And advanced tax strategies. Um, but also, like you mentioned, you do a lot of speaking. You probably heard them on Bigger Pockets, um, you know, Forbes Financial Council, Money Magazine. So these are some authorities in this space. So, um, you know, very glad to have you on once again. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's start off with some, I have some questions that I want to get answers to. And I think, you know, it'll be a good way to just kind of structure this um, conversation. So um, let's start off with one thing. So we have, as you mentioned, a lot of professionals. So we're not getting a lot of tax breaks for our kids. So, you know, how as an entrepreneur, let's talk about how you can kind of pay your kids and how you can use um, your kids as a tax advantage. Yeah, it's such a such a great question. It's one of our favorite topics. I mean, because a lot of times where people are, um, you know, they they I think they they ask the wrong or they approach it from the wrong way, right? They they say, yeah. "Can I deduct my kids?" But the, the the better way to ask ask that is, "How can I deduct my kids?" I mean, we all know that we're you know kids are expensive. You're paying money for them anyway. So the idea being that you know get them to help you in your business, whether it's you know your medical business, your service business, your real estate business, whatever it is, get them to help you in your business. Um, pay them for the work that they're doing. So you're taking a tax deduction for it. And, you know, presumably your high rate could be 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar, right? Um, and then for your child, you know, right now the standard deduction is around $12,500, you know, adjusts a little bit every year. But what that means is that for each child, you know, they can basically make $12,500 up to that amount and not have to pay any income taxes on it. So you could be saving it, you know, again, 50 cents on the dollar, they're paying 0%. It's the same money we know you're giving them before anyway, right? Now we're just trying to find a way to take a tax deduction so we can save as a family. Mm -hmm. And the older, I mean, there's not really a specific age requirement in terms of like how old how, or how young the kids have to be. But um, because the IRS does require that the, the amount you pay them is reasonable for what they're doing for you. Um, so naturally what that ends up being is like the older the kids are, the more uh, or the higher dollar of pay you can justify right so like a two three year old there's you know they, they're cute they probably take some pictures and pay them for that Models. but they're probably yeah <laughs> they're probably not going to be like your it consultant or they're not going to help you with the zoom but when they get a little bit older right you know 10 years old 12 15 16 then it really the, then you really start to see the significance in tax savings because they can do a lot more for you in your business so if we're telling our children they're worthless it might just be that the parent doesn't know their worth then, huh? <laughs> yeah. Gosh, well, I hope we're not telling them their worth. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, but when you're paying your kids, you do have to pay them at fair market value, right? You can't pay them $100,000 to come pick up trash around your office. Right, because if you're going to do that, I'm going to send my kid to your office to pick up trash. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're going to have a yes. lot of employees. 
Yeah. Yes. And then the other thing to keep in mind too is that um, you know, you want to make sure what that the kids are actually performing the task. So sometimes a lot of people say, like, hey, I'm gonna pay my kids for last year. They didn't do much, but I could, you know, I'm just gonna, I already gave them money. Um, so it's really important to make sure that they're actually doing. Uh, what you've hired them to do, right? Very, very important. Because also you get to teach your kids to be involved in your real estate or in your business. And that's like an invaluable lesson. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about the role of LLCs because a lot of people think, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm starting a business. Let me get an LLC because I need an LLC to save on taxes. But I know that's laughable to you guys. Talk to us of what LLCs are truly for you know, I know that they do have some tax ramifications, but talk to us about that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, you know, the, it's one of those where the answer really depends on the specific entrepreneur or the specific investor. But, um, you know, if we're talking about an active business, so let's say you're a physician and you have your own medical practice or you're just starting to do some kind of medical consulting on the side, um, it could make sense to have a legal entity like an LLC. Um, to be operating that type of active income. And the reason for that is, um, you know, there's things you can do in the tax world to save on uh, taxes using lower tax rates and things like that. Um, but in terms of, you know, your comment on deductions, right, that's, there's absolutely no truth to that. I mean, if you decided to start your business or real estate tomorrow, whether you do that in your personal name or in an LLC, you get the same write-offs in both scenarios. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing to think about, you know, outside of taxes, just from a, you know, big picture business perspective is, you know, you may want to have a legal entity for asset protection reasons, you know, right. minimize your risk from lawsuits and that thing. And I know, you know, you have, you, you've got a lot of medical professionals listening. I know certain states you are allowed to use LLCs for, you know, service type businesses like that. Some states require you to have corporations, so, you know, some, they need to check with their own state. Also, obviously, talk to their asset protection attorney to, you know, get them on the team and make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Do you see a lot of, I know a lot of people, you know, you have the Wyoming and the different states where your names can be hidden. Do you see a lot of just kind of LLCs stacked on top of each other that don't necessarily have to be when you're dealing with your clients? Um, all the time. <laughs> and I think that's one of the misconceptions. That was a loaded question. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> You know, there's so much confusion around legal entities. I think what a lot of people do is they maybe hear something on a podcast or they read a blog and, and then they go out and they just start forming entities, right? Because they're told or, or somehow they perceive that as like, I have to have all these legal entities so that I can write things off. And um, a part of that, I think, is just misinformation, you know, being spread, unfortunately, by professionals who want you to, to form these entities and things like that. Um, it's funny, actually, someone shared with me the other day, it was like someone on TikTok uh, was a video that said, you know, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is go out and form a bunch of LLCs. And then every LLC, you're going to go out and get a credit, you know, $10,000 or $100,000 in credit. And then you're going to start investing. Um, and those things are just crazy, right? So, so what we look at from an advisory perspective is what is the least number of legal entities that you need to get you the tax benefit or the asset protection. And again, it'll differ from person to person, but if you're just starting out, you have one rental property, uh, one LLC is probably you know, sufficient, right? If you buy another rental property, you can maybe use that same LLC or maybe you have a second LLC. Uh, but what you don't wanna do is before having real estate, before generating profit from a business to go out and form all these different entities because they all come with formation costs, state fees, you know, tax filing fees. And so you don't want to have no profit and have all your cash be eaten up by those expenses that might not be necessary just yet. Yeah. You, I mean, you like anything, you have to understand the uh, cost versus benefit, right? What is going to be the cost of, as Amanda said, setting it up, filing fees? Do you need a tax return for every entity versus what is the benefit that you're going to get? Now, obviously, granted, you know, part of this conversation is going to be your attorney and some of that benefit is going to be hard to quantify, obviously, because well, if I set it up correctly, I run it correctly, I'm not going to ever get sued, but it's the unknown that you're trying to protect yourself against. And, you know, everyone's going to have their own risk tolerance level and determining what makes sense in their situation for sure. So would you advise, do you talk to your accountant or CPA first, or do you talk to your lawyer first? I know ideally they have a relationship with each other, but how would you advise people to kind of start there? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really important to decide who's first. Um, you know, ultimately, you want both of them to chime in on that particular decision making process. So, for example, if a client came to us first on the legal entity side, we'll kind of talk about the tax implications if there is any, and um, and then you know they'll interview an attorney. And what I always tell clients is before you actually form an entity or dissolve an entity, let me know. Um, because I want to know what is the attorney recommending and just, you know, just double check or confirm that there's no tax issues associated with it. But you're right. I mean, to, to, to work as a team cohesively with the tax and legal side, uh, and maybe with a lender, you know, if you're in real estate, maybe with a lender too, because financing sometimes involves legal entities too, but coming together as a team so that you as the investor or business owner can get um, the best uh, recommendation. Now, in your firm, do you have affiliation with lawyers or do you just kind of have people recommend in, give recommendations? How is that set up? Uh, so, yeah, for I mean, the way we work, we do have a handful of attorneys that a lot of our clients work with. So, for example, if you come to us and you don't have an existing relationship with an attorney, um, then we'll provide you a list. And you can interview any and all of them. You can decide to go with one of them or somebody completely different. Um, but, yeah, there's not really, a, you know, kind of a, a preference. I mean, because everybody has a different risk tolerance level. And again, some people, you know, might already have an attorney that they really like. So at the end of the day, as long as we're all sitting at the table, uh, you know, virtually or in person, that's all that really matters. So one word that you mentioned that I think is so important and so critical is interviewing. You know, so many times, especially as medical professionals, um, you know, we've been guilty of just saying, all right, who do you use? Okay, I'll use this person or because it, but some people just don't fit. So you need to know who fits best with you. So truthfully sitting down, having an interview or a conversation to be able to discuss your goals and dreams um, and see if they align well, because everybody just because you're popular or just because you have a big name might not align with your, your true purpose or really have the same vision that you have for your, your, your goals and uh, especially for wealth building. The Sabre Training Bat. It's like no other training bat you've ever used before. So the purpose of the Sabre training bat with its modified barrel is so that you can perfectly sequence and get behind the ball, getting the bat on plane sooner, creating less miss hits, more line drives, higher batting averages, and more exit velocity. The Sabre training bat is the number one training bat on the market. Sabre bats. The training bat that's going to take you to your best swing. Yeah, for sure. And I think also too, like risk tolerance, you know, are you more conservative as a taxpayer or are you more aggressive as a taxpayer and, and finding a CPA or a tax advisor that kind of fits, you know, that similar risk tolerance level is also very important as well. So what about business travel? This is something that, you know, for entrepreneurs, we're going to move and travel anyway, but how do we take advantage of some of the tax strategies for uh, business travel? Yeah, well, in regards to business travel, what we like to tell our clients is the uh, best thing to do is get the uh, predetermined business purpose, right? So what does that mean? It means kind of setting up your, before you're booking airline tickets, hotel, hotel reservations, does it have that have that plan in place as of what you're going to do for business purposes on the trip. So it's not, it's everything's predetermined set up ahead of time versus uh, what we like to say, getting to the place and deciding, Oh, I'm going to go look at properties while I'm here. That's not a, that's not a business trip. That's a personal trip where you happen to go look at properties on the side. Right. So it's all about setting it up and getting that, you know, kind of the documentation in place ahead of time is probably the biggest tip. All right. And then um, retirement planning. So as we mentioned, talking to a business, professionals many times retirement planning is whoever comes to your hospital or whoever they have a relationship with and they say here's your 401k package sign here and boom you know for many people that's the end I've even heard of some people who you know have not even taken advantage of that but let's talk about retirement planning um, you know one thing about your book that you did such a great job talking about diversification versus specification and I thought that was very brilliant uh, so talk to, kind of talk to me about what those two terms mean. 
Yeah, well, so, um, you know, because a lot of our clients are real estate investors, um, one of the struggles we work with people on is this concept of whether I should put my money into retirement account. So we'll give an example of a physician, right? So let's say you made uh, $400,000 this year and we said, hey, you know, you can set up a, a 401k, maybe like a defined benefit plan on top of that, where you can shelter $150,000 or $200,000 of your income. Uh, from taxes. And so inevitably the client's like, oh, well, that sounds great. I would love to put a hundred or 200,000 into a retirement account and save on taxes, but I really wanted to use that money for real estate. Um, and so now I have the struggle of, should I save for retirement? Should I buy real estate? And um, one of the ways that you can accomplish both both is to use self-directed accounts. So simply means you're still funding the retirement account, but once the money's in there, instead of being tied up in the stock market and mutual funds, you have control over that money. So that money could be used to invest in real estate. It could be used to invest in, I don't know, your cousin's startup business, right? All types of, of alternative assets outside of just the stock market. Um, and when we talk, and, and the reason that a lot of people like to do that is this, this whole concept of you know, being specific and investing in something where you have unique knowledge and insight and experience. So if you or I are not well versed in Tesla or what Apple is doing, but we really understand real estate, then of course it makes more sense for us to put our retirement money in real estate. Or if you're a medical professional, you know someone is inventing something, you know, some kind of pain management device, you're like, hey, I would like to invest my retirement money in that because I know that's gonna take off. Um, and so, so that's what we talk about in the book in terms of investing in what you know best. Yeah, and I think another thing we talk about too is just the idea that I think a lot of people don't, with people with their own business, entrepreneurs, they don't necessarily, uh, a lot of them don't know that they can have another retirement account that's in addition to that traditional IRA, the Roth IRA. Uh, maybe they have a W-2 job and they've got a, you know, a side, side business, you know, kind of they're starting up their own business. They can have their own retirement account in that that's on top of the 401k at their own job. So there's a lot of ways to layer on top of things for those service professionals that can, you know, kind of supercharge their retirement, take advantage of, you know, a lot of it that's a lot of it that's available to them. And speak to why, you know, I know personally, I've brought it up talking to financial planners. Hey, what about self-directed 401k? And it's usually, eh, mm, mm, I don't really know. Maybe, maybe ask somebody else, you know, why might that be the answer? Number one, other than not having knowledge about it, which a lot of people probably still don't, but talk to that, speak to that. Yeah, it's really interesting because self-directed investing, um, you know, self-directed 401k or IRA is the same as any regular 401k and IRA. The only difference is in the traditional types of accounts, like what you're talking with your financial advisor on, you're very limited, right? So they're saying, hey, you can invest in stocks, mutual funds, bonds, that, that's pretty much it. And versus a self-directed, like it sounds, is what, what do you want to invest in? So I don't have a, a, a portfolio of options. You're just out there in the world shopping. So you're shopping for a property on Main Street, or you're shopping, you're going to lend money again to your cousin or somebody else who has a new medical device coming up. And the reason why a lot of traditional financial advisors don't talk about that or don't want to talk about it is because when you ask them those types of questions, you're sort of taking money away from them, right? Because let's say you're with Fidelity, your advisor wants your money in one of the Fidelity, um, you know, stocks. Uh, but if you say, okay, I want to move it to real estate, well, now they're no longer making money on that. Um, so it's not, it does not incentivize them to learn or advise you on how you can control your own money outside of their platform, uh, which is an unfortunate but true uh, fact. And that's why we're so passionate about just educating people like you can control your retirement money. You don't have to stay in the stock market if you didn't want to. And that's one thing I want people to hear when you're dealing with your banker or your investment company they are selling products that they sell. <laughs> you know, they want you to buy into this because that's how they get a percentage of it. But so it's really up to each individual to be educated so that when you go to the table, you can ask, hey, what do you think about this? And get a response versus just being sold, uh, you know, the menu, basically. And I think that goes back to what you were talking about earlier, right? It's just developing those relationships so that you can have that conversation that may be uncomfortable to some to some people because 
hey, I'm suggesting something that's financial advisor. And I know they're not going to, you know, quote unquote, like, but if you've got that relationship where they're going to be honest with you, they can give you their honest feedback that is outside of the fact that they're going to, you know, lose commissions or whatever, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Can I tell you something really funny? So we always tell clients like, hey, if you want to move your money to, you know, a startup business or real estate, you can do that. You just move it to a self-directed custodian. A lot of times they'll come back and say, oh, my guy at Fidelity said they do self-directed. So I can leave my money there and do self-directed. But when they say self-directed, what they're really saying is you can choose from Again, my portfolio of yeah, stocks. You, you can direct your money from, from this into one of <laughs> our hand, ten, ten accounts. Right, right. So you can choose yeah. either Apple or Tesla or but you can choose. I was like, no, that's the true self-directed is where <laughs> you're out there in the world shopping. You know, you, you're not looking at portfolio of stuff. <laughs> so how do you get access to the true self-directed 401ks? Yeah, I mean, you can you can actually just Google. <laughs> you can do a Google search, self-directed custodians. Um, I usually, you know, usually you can look for self-directed and real estate, self-directed and notes. Um, but those are the companies. Again, how do you know if you're working with a true self-directed custodian? You know, because they do not have any portfolio of assets to offer you. In fact, the vast majority of them um, limit themselves in that they won't give you investment advice because they don't know. They, I mean, they don't know whether you should buy property on Main Street or another one on Fremont Street, right? It has nothing to do with them. They're just holding your money for you and you are the one making the investment decision. So they're not gonna come to you with option one, two, and three. That's all completely up to your control. So I think you just justified for many listeners that know you're not crazy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you knew for the last eight to 10 years, hey, I could get a self-directed 401k, even though you've been told multiple times the answer is no. So thank you for that information. All right. So another thing is capital gains. Um, you know, so we're talking about real estate and you have a property, you come in forced appreciation or whatever you sell. Let's talk about, well, first, before we get into capital gains, let's talk about 10, uh, 1031 and how you can move those gains, what 1031 is and how you can shelter um, from taxes when you do have gains. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, a 1031 exchange is uh, in the tax world, it's, we call it a tax deferred exchange, but basically you're able to sell one or more existing properties that, you know, in the real world, you're expecting to pay taxes on that because you've got some gains that you built up on you know, a forced appreciation, whatever it is, right? Um, you're able to sell one or more of those properties, buy replacement properties, uh, and not have to pay taxes on those properties that you just sold right now. You're basically kicking the, you know, kicking the tax can down the road. Um, but it's a great way to continue to leverage your portfolio. Uh, continue to grow your portfolio into better performing assets without having that, you know, that, that, that the tax drag, if you will, that's, you know, slowing you down. Um, Cause obviously if you're going to, you know, sell properties and pay 50, hundred grand in taxes, I mean, that's 50 to hundred thousand dollars less of a down payment money you have for, for more properties. Right. So that's the benefit of a 1031 exchange. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So let's talk about the inheritance kind of versus gifting. That was another great uh, topic that you discussed in your book. And I had a similar situation having a discussion recently and that really opened my eyes about how if you inherit something now versus at death, how they can differ from a tax standpoint. Yeah. So the way it works is if you um, if, you know, let's say we're going from generation to generation. So when parents start to give away their assets, whether it's stocks or real estate or businesses, um, it's considered a gift. So from a gift perspective, the recipient, in our example, the, the, the kids or the next generation, um, they get what's called carryover basis, which means if we use a house as an example, if parents bought it for $100,000 and now it's worth $500,000. When they gift it to their kids, the kids get the $100,000 value. And so at some point, if the kids were to sell that real estate, then odds are they're going to have to pay a huge amount of capital gains taxes. Um, now, so the better way to do it is to do it via inheritance. And so what we mean by that is, let's say same house, parents bought it for $100,000. Let's say by the time the parents pass away, now this house is worth $800,000. And if the kids then inherit that property, then they will get 
fair market value of $800,000. And so, which means that if at some point in the future they were to sell that property, the first $800,000 becomes completely tax free to the kids. Um, and that's why it's really, really important, a very significant um, legacy planning tool to be looking at what is the best way to move the asset to the next generation. Yeah, so that's huge. I mean, the difference between having to pay on six or seven hundred thousand dollars of taxes versus having that completely sheltered can be, you know, generations worth of wealth. For sure. And, you know, we see that as a mistake a lot because, uh, and, you know, this happened to me too. Like, you know, when parents get older, it's kind of a natural thing to say, well, I really just don't want this anymore. I just want to give it to my kids, right? Kind of like get it off my plate. Um, and so they start, you know, changing title or just adding the kids to title without really talking to their advisors about it um, and like we're saying you know that could be a very costly mistake so those are times where um, definitely worth a conversation with your advisory team to say okay is this the best way to do it or are there better ways that we can plan for you know um, legacy planning yeah because another situation that comes up a lot too is uh, similar to what she just mentioned is it's the uh, parent saying i want to add my you know getting up there in years i want to have somebody help me with you know finances and being able to make decisions on the property. So I'm just going to, I'm going to add my son to the title or I'm going to quick claim the property to my kid just so that they, they're on paperwork and they can make decisions. Well, when you do that, obviously it can have adverse tax consequences. A lot of people aren't thinking about. All right. Is that just like adding, say, I'm going to add my kid's name as a joint um, business partner on my bank account. Is that similar? The money that becomes theirs at that point or inheritance Versus if they do it later, it's a little bit different with a bank account, but it's same same theory though, right? Like it's a, it can be a lot worse consequences when you're talking about property, obviously. Yeah, I think the better way to do it if if you're just like, hey, I want to have my kids or other family members help me in making decisions or help me in taking care of the day to day stuff, um, you can do that, you know, through other legal paperwork, right? So becoming a manager in my entity or being my representative, uh, though that's perfectly fine to do. And that's different than just me adding my kids to title and me giving them actual ownership of something. Perfect, perfect. All right, so on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final Time Out. So for a lot of listeners, someone's angry, because they've been lying to me all this time. You know, someone's sitting here like they've been drinking out of fire holes, just completely overwhelmed. So everybody, let's take a deep breath and speak to each listener about no matter where you are, how you can start from this day forward, kind of moving forward to take advantage of some of these tax benefits and to get your finances in order. Um, you know, I think that the one thing that we should all be doing is having tax planning in the back of our mind um, and having create creating a habit out of it. And I don't mean again, don't mean you know becoming a CPA, learning all about taxes, but when you're spending money, before you're spending money on any significant items, whether it's a trip or a car or a vacation, ask yourself, you know, how can I make this a tax deductible expense? Um, sometimes the answer is easy. Sometimes the answer might be, you know, unsure. You don't really know what it is. And those, the unsure ones are where you involve your tax advisor. But asking that how question, I think is very, very powerful uh, because it helps to, you know, get you in the right mind frame to figure out, is the money I'm spending something that could help me save on taxes? And for the higher your income is, the more important it is to, to do this exercise frequently. Because if you're someone at 30, 40% tax bracket, every $100 is going to save you $40 in actual cash. And along those same lines, I'd say just uh, take a snapshot or an inventory of where your finances are at. You know, we're, we're coming up on year end, obviously, and this is a good time to kind of think about next year, obviously. But doing it more frequently that even every quarter, maybe, you know, where it's kind of figuring out where am I at, you know, what, what were my goals with my business or my real estate investing? Or I wanted to get into real estate and I wanted to start it. You know, I'm, Hey, I'm, I'm six years old. Is that too late? No, it's not too late. I mean, you know, you, you, you get started sooner than later. Right. And um, you know, again, just take an inventory of that and, and get the ball rolling and meet up with your advisors, have that open line of communication like we're talking about. So are there still things that people can do? You know, right now we're sitting at the beginning of December and I want to get this out as soon as possible so people can really listen and implement some of these things. But are there still things, I know short term real estate has some tax loopholes. Are there still things that people can do now to close out the year to kind of change their trajectory? 
Yeah, for sure. Year end planning is one of our favorite uh, planning times of the year. Um, you know, we use a sports analogy. <laughs> right. Well, she likes, she, right likes to, yeah, she, she likes to claim that, you know, well, you know, what happens during, you know, the first 95% of the game doesn't matter because it's, it's only what the score is at the end. Now, you know, obviously that's technically true, but we all know that you do need to watch the entire game to know what's going on. Right. But, <laughs> but having said that, yeah, yeah. So it's not how you start; it's how you finish. That's right. Yeah, exactly. yeah I guess. <laughs> so year and planning is the same, right? Your your income might you know go up or down. Your expenses might be up and down during the year, but what matters, what determines how much taxes you pay next April, is where your numbers fall at the end of the year. So for business owners, you you know I would look ahead at like what are some expected expenses I know I'll have in January, and should I prepay those before the end of the year? If you accelerate your expenses by even just one or two days, that accelerates your deduction for a whole entire year um, but yeah investment wise as well you know whether it's short-term rentals or other investments they could potentially have an impact on your taxes and so um, you know I would definitely consider those types of investment moves before year end and there's also a lot of different uh, charitable gifting uh, strategies that people can take advantage of that um, that can cover you know many years and it's, it can be more than just obviously giving the cash writing a check or even taking the you know, inventory of the family stuff down to goodwill and getting rid of all your spouse's things that she doesn't need anymore by December 31st. It <laughs> can be more than that, stuff. you know. <laughs> right. I love that. Not your golf clubs, but make sure you right, take right, all those right, purses. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm not a hoarder. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, so tell people how they, number one, can follow what you're doing, how they can learn more, or how even they can partner up with Keystone CPAs. Yes, we have a ton of great information. Um, we actually have a free downloadable tax savings toolkit uh, where you can learn all about, you know, more about income shifting and legal entities and the short-term rental loophole. Uh, it's on our website at keystonecpa.com. And um, the best place to find us on social media, uh, probably just to follow me because Matt's not on social media very much. Uh, my, uh, I just mean, do what she tells me to do. Yes, I'm go. mostly found Smart on man. Instagram. <laughs> Uh, Amanda Han CPA. So over there, we, uh, you know, have uh, tried to give people a lot of tax updates and uh, little tips, um, as well as if you, you know, just want to know what we're doing life in general, that's a good place to follow us. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great episode, a very informative episode for me. So I can't wait to get this out to the audience. And um, hopefully we can continue to grow together. Yes, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace.